Can y'all see what that is? Yeah. When I do these PowerPoints and I'm sitting on my computer, I'm like, oh, that picture looks really good. And I put it up there. Oh, it looks great. And then when you put it on the screen, it's like, what is that? I hope you can see these with the right one. As long as you can see the writing, I guess that's all that really matters. Now, don't dim it too much because you don't want to get them to sleep in or nothing. <laughs> all right, Psalm 119, verse 98, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Another scripture that goes along with this is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, where the Bible says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth but the word of our God shall stand forever. And that's why I put the hayfield out there because I thought, oh, a hayfield goes kind of along with that verse about grass withering or whatever. But the point of these verses is pretty simple. God's word is going to be around forever. God's word does not get old. God's word does not wear out. You know, he compares it to all these other things, you know, grass and flowers and things like that. They all get old and they all perish and vanish away, but God's word doesn't. So when we think about is God's word relevant today, the Bible makes the claim that it's always going to be relevant. I mean, if you just think about it, if this really comes from God and God doesn't change, then is the Bible ever going to lose its importance? No. Here's another scripture. Remember what Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 35, when he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Okay, that's a scripture we all know. Jesus, again, simply emphasizing the fact that all these other things vanish. The heavens and the earth itself, as big and as great as those things are, they're going to end, but God's word isn't. So what that tells me is that God's word is more powerful than the universe itself. It's more important, and it goes on forever. Going back to the book of Psalms again, Psalm 119 and verse 160 the Bible says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So over and over again in the Bible, we see this claim being made that God's word is going to be eternal, that it's always going to be relevant. All right? Now, what makes the Bible relevant? What makes it to where the Bible is something that humanity will always need? Why are we always going to need this book? Why is it that it's never going to fade away or or grow old. Well, let me run by some, or run some comments by you here really quick, some thoughts. These are very simple and they're very general, but these are things that we take for granted sometimes. Why is the Bible so important? Well, number one, it tells you about your Creator. Why would you not want to know that? Why would you not want to know where you come from? And it even tells us about the state of man. Why are we here? What's our purpose? Where are we going? It even tells us about the way of salvation. Basically, that teaches you about eternity. There's going to be an eternity where people are going to spend either in heaven or hell forever. Don't you want to know about that so you can be ready for that? So obviously, if you just look at these things, they're basic to us as Christians, but they're very profound and they're very deep and they're very meaningful. But adding to this list, the Bible gives us light to direct our lives. It gives us food to sustain us, and it gives us comfort to cheer us whenever we go through difficult situations in life. The Bible gets more practical than simply giving us things about you know, who our Creator is, who we are, where we're going. Those are important, but it gives us even practical things in our lives. We all need guidance, don't we? Don't we need to know what we're doing and where we're going? Don't we need to have something to keep us going, to sustain us, and don't we need to have comfort sometimes? Of course we do. Well, the Bible gives us those things. The Bible is the, is the traveler's map, it's the soldier's sword, and it's the Christian's charter. I can stand up here all day long and show you all these things that makes the Bible important, all of these great qualities that we see in the Bible, and sometimes you show people that, and a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I guess that's important, but even then, a lot of people don't really see that as making the Bible all that important. Well, I'm going to come back to those here in just a little bit, and we're going to talk about why those things are important and why it is that so many people don't see them as important. But before we do that, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the state of the Bible 
as it stands now in 2016. How do people, the, the common average American people, what is their take on the Bible? And is their take on the Bible improving or is it just sort of going downhill? What are the average Americans thinking about the Bible? Well, the American Bible Organization did a State of the Bible report for 2016, and these are some of the findings that they uh, presented. They said, the people who say the Bible is not a sufficient guide for meaningful living has risen 23% to 33%. Now again, these are current statistics. And so what it's telling you is that the amount of people who... And now, be careful when you read this. This doesn't mean that these people don't believe the Bible or that they don't think the Bible came from God. It's just that the, these are the amount of people who don't really think it has anything for them. So this isn't necessarily talking about people abandoning belief in God. These statistics are just people who don't use the Bible. They don't think the Bible can do anything for them. So that number has gone up. The report also found this. The percentage of Americans who view the Bible as a book of teachings written by men has risen from 10% to 22% over the past six years. Now, again, you have to kind of be careful with that. When you talk about the Bible being written by men, well, in reality, it was written by men. People did write the Bible, but they didn't write down what they wanted to write. They were writing under the guidance of God. But what they mean here when they say written by men is it was written by men because men concocted it. They just completely came up with it on their own. That number has risen. You know, it's gone up to 22%. And that's just over the past six years. That's been since 2010. Really, that's not all that long ago if you think about it in the big scheme of things. And if it's gone up that much over the past six years, what is it going to be like in the next? The next six years and then on down the line. You know, it's just, if, if this trend continues, what is it going to be like? And really by me showing you this, I guess I'm not really presenting anything you don't already know. Because again, if we just simply look at the, the things that are going on around us, we can tell that things are not going the way they should. And we can tell that a lot of people are beginning to, sort of lay the Bible to the side. And when I talk about people laying the Bible to the side, it's even Christian people. We talked about this last week, but even Christian people treat the Bible as if it's irrelevant. When you just have a Bible and you let that thing sit on the coffee table all week long, you never pick it up, but all week long you're going out there shopping and Facebooking and texting, don't tell me the Bible's relevant to you. When you, we do not pay any attention to it, we are just as guilty as the atheists. We can't do that. You know, we can't point the finger at them and say, shame on you for not believing in the Bible. Shame on you for not using that book when we don't use it ourselves. So we have to be careful with that, even religious people. So this is an epidemic affecting everybody. And if you want to know the honest truth, America is on its way to becoming a post-Christian nation. That's really the direction that we're heading right now. And that's really the direction that a lot of Americans want to go. Because if you get rid of God and you get rid of Christianity, then that frees you up to do really whatever you want to do. And the main idea of it, I guess, would be if we can get rid of God and can get rid of the Bible, which is his rule book, live without any of these God-given rules, then we don't have to worry about any consequences for anything that we do. And so all of these things lead to the fact that many people just simply don't care about the Bible the way that they should. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 18, the Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Do people not realize that in God's Word there is power? This verse says that there are people who do not recognize that. There are people that the preaching of the cross, the teaching of Jesus, that's what that means. The teaching of Jesus, it's meaningless. They don't see any power in it. They see power in money. That gets me what I want. They see power in going out and doing all these fun things. That, that gets me what I want. What's the Bible got for me? And again, even religious people are affected by this. They don't see there's power in the Bible, in the preaching of the cross, 
to give them the things that they need in their life. So again, America is heading down uh, that, this road of becoming post-Christian. Alright? Hang on, back up. One thing you got to understand, though, is that just because people are heading that way, just because so many people are now beginning to disbelieve the Bible doesn't mean that it's irrelevant. We sort of have the tendency that we like to jump on the bandwagon. And we look around and we think, well, that's the way everybody else is going. Everybody else is heading off in the direction that the Bible, they don't go by it, they don't live by it, they're doing their own thing. And so we just sort of want to jump on the bandwagon ourselves and go along with it. But I guess the Bible's useless then. I don't see anybody really paying any attention to it. So it's not doing these people any good. What makes me think it's going to do me any good? And so we just go right along with everybody else. But look what the Bible says about that. Romans 3, verse 3. Do you know this was in the Bible? Romans 3, 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Is the disbelief of people, is that going to make God's word without effect irrelevant? Well, the obvious answer to this question is, no, it's not. So, that is something that they were dealing with even back in Bible times. Here in Romans 3, 3, Paul is addressing that very scenario. Is the unbelief of so many people, does that mean that what we're believing and teaching and doing, does that mean it's all for nothing? And Paul gives the answer, of course, here, no, it doesn't. So we can't just jump on the bandwagon and go the direction everybody else is going. Now, Here's a very serious question that we need to consider because this is one big thing that runs through the minds of a lot of people and especially, I guess, the millennial generation, the, the younger generation nowadays. This is a very serious question and the one that they want answers to. They say, well, if there really is a God and the Bible is His message, it's His Word, then why doesn't the Bible really stand out? I mean, you think about it, there's so many other holy books across the world. I mean, the Buddhists have theirs, and the Hindus have their religious books, and, you know, the Muslims have the Quran. And isn't it just sort of that the, the Bible just sort of blends in with all of them? And which one really is from God? Why should I say the Bible? People say, well, if the Bible really is from God, shouldn't it stand out above the rest? And, and you, you try to say, well, yeah, it stands out. I mean, how many people you know around you've got a Quran? How many people you know around you've got Buddhist books? Nobody. But if you tell somebody that, that's what they're going to say. Like I say, well, of course nobody around here has any of those books because we're living in the Bible Belt. We're living in Tennessee. We're living in one of the areas down south where the Bible is prominent. But just because it's prominent in our area doesn't mean it stands out in the entire world. I mean, if I was born in India, I'd be believing in those Hindu books, wouldn't I? If I was born in China, I'd be a Buddhist and believing in those Buddhist writings. If I was born over there in the Middle East, I'd be believing in the Quran. So really, they're going to say it really just depends on where you're born, which book stands out to you. The Bible cannot claim to stand out above the rest. It may stand out in a particular area, but not on a global scale. That's really the way that a lot of people are beginning to look at it. And even down here in the Bible, but that's what they're saying. They're saying, the only reason we believe in the Bible is just because we were brought up that way, and it's all because of where we live. And if you think I'm joking on this, I'll tell you the people who are really pushing this idea are atheists. The guy I showed you last week, Richard Dawkins, I had him up here on the screen or whatever, that's one of the biggest things he's constantly saying. He's always saying, well, you know, the only reason you believe in the Christian God is because you were born in an area where the Bible is prominent. You know, if you were born in India, you'd be a Hindu, so on and so forth. And by the way, I was thinking about this too, being that we're talking about Richard Dawkins. I was watching a video of him before where they were interviewing him and they asked him, they said, well, you know, you're an atheist. And they said, well, what, what, if, what if it happened that when you died, you met God. Turns out you were wrong. What would you say to him? And Richard Dawkins, he thought on it for a second. He said, I know what I'd say. 
I'd say, well, which God are you? Are you the Buddhist God? Are you the Hindu God? What, you know, what God are you? And he said it real smug and real kind of arrogant. And I got to thinking after he said that, I thought, no, he wouldn't. I'd say, you wouldn't say that because you know immediately which God that is. Everybody will know. There's no sense in having to ask that. And he knows that the Christian God is really the main God that stands out. Let me show you this information. The Bible does stand out globally against any other book. Um, I mentioned this to you before, but each and every year the Bible is the best seller. It tops every book every year. Every time they do a bestseller list, the Bible always trumps everything. Um, but did you know this? Did you know that 50 Bibles are sold roughly about every minute? And these are rough statistics. 50 Bibles just about every minute. 100 million Bibles are put out every year, whether they're sold or they're given away for free or whatever. Roughly about 100 million every year. So there's no doubt that it's the world's most popular book. I mean, I've given you statistics on this before, and I can give you a whole bunch more than this. No book stands out like the Bible does. No book has touched humanity as deeply as that book. If we were to look at the world and say, show me a book that stands out above the rest, you'd have to say the Bible. And a lot of people have to admit that. And here's one thing some people might say when you show them this. They'll say, okay, maybe you're right. Maybe the Bible does stand out in the world today. But that doesn't mean it's always stood out in the world, does it? You know, people will say, I bet way back there in ancient times, I bet the Bible wasn't very popular. I bet the Bible way back when there wasn't a whole lot of people who went for it. Well, I'm going to show you this information. I've already given it to you before. But if you look at the Bible from a perspective of ancient history, it stands out the most. As far as Bible manuscripts go, when it comes to the New Testament, we got 6,000 of them jokers. All other books from ancient history, the most we have of them is maybe 100, 200, maybe 300, that's it. But when you come to the New Testament, you got 6,000 of them jokers. And historians will tell you that's the best preserved book from ancient history we got. We don't have a book that compares to this from ancient history. So even from the standpoint of way back when the Bible's been popular, it's always been like that. So, when you look at verses like this one, Romans 10, 18, you know the Bible's telling you the truth. Romans 10, 18 says, Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. And that's talking about people preaching the Bible. The message that they preached when they preached the gospel, it touched the whole world. And so does the Bible stand out on a global scale as being a book that definitely is different from the rest? Absolutely. There's no book in the world, in the history of the world, that has been, or that has made this big of an impact. And so, like I said, you look at verses like Romans 10, 18, yeah, it makes sense. But the Bible says there is true, it has touched the whole world. Now, let's talk about this for just a second. We know there's a lot of people who are beginning to view the Bible as unimportant as something that's old, useless, we don't really need it today, it's meaningless. Why is that? Why, why more and more is that happening? We, well, I've sort of already mentioned it to you, but let's read this scripture together, and I think the Bible will give us an answer as to why so many people disregard it. This is Psalm 19, verses 8 through 11. And this is King David speaking here. He says, The statutes of the Lord are right, Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Now I read this scripture. And I've probably read it a hundred times. But here recently when I read it, I actually stopped and was trying to understand what is he really wanting to communicate here. And I got to look at the things that he said. Obviously what he's doing is he's trying to tell you that the Bible is better than these things. The 
Bible is better than this and it's better than that. Well, what things? What are the things he says here that the Bible is superior to? Well, there's specifically two things that he says here. He says the Bible is better, first of all, if I can find it, it's better than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. And then he says it's better, it's sweeter than honey. So honey and gold are the two things he compares the Bible to here. Now honey and gold may not have that big of a significance to us today. Maybe especially the honey part. Maybe a lot of us still are really into gold. But these are two items that at that time, the time of King David, those were two items that were very highly sought after. I mean, we know that gold today is still you know, sought after. People want gold in their jewelry and things like that. Gold still holds a lot of value, but honey we kind of don't really see the value to because nowadays to get honey, all we got to do is go to Walmart. There it is. Uh, you didn't go to Walmart to get honey back then. Honey was a little bit more difficult to obtain, and once you got some of it, it was valuable. So what he's saying is these are things... He picks out basically two things that he knows people of the world really strongly desire. Two things that give people pleasure. They just love it to death. He says, as valuable as these things are to you, as much as you love them, he says, God's Word is even better than that. Now, to help you to understand this verse, it might help you if you put this verse in modern terms here. Why don't you just read that verse and replace gold and honey with Two things in your life personally that you love to death. Just think right now, what are some things in my life? Two things in my life that I constantly am doing that I'm just addicted to. Can't get enough of. And read that verse and replace it there. And then ask yourself, can I honestly say the Bible means more to me than these things? Can I honestly say that I care more about what God says than these two things right here? And that right there will help put things in perspective for you in your own life, am I really giving God the place that He should have or am I letting these worldly pleasures come before Him? And you think about gold here, for, for instance. I mean, this remember who's saying all this. This is King David. If there ever was a man who should have let money and gold and honey and all these good fine things of life get to him and lead him away from God, it should have been King David. Buster, he was rolling in the stuff. But even as rich and as wealthy as he was, he had all this access to these things that could have easily have led him away from God. Look how faithful he remained. He still remained a man after God's own heart. So that means a lot to me that King David said this. This is not some guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. This is King David who makes this statement. But notice these verses as well when you come over into the New Testament. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, Paul mentions that there are many people who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Love pleasure more than they do God. 2 Timothy 3, 4. Isn't that bad? The one who gave us life and the one who gave us everything we have, we love pleasing ourselves more than Him. Isn't that bad when people do that? Terrible. Yet people do it so often even today. Let's turn our Bibles to Philippians 3. Philippians 3, let's go to verses 18 and 19. Philippians chapter 3, I want somebody to read 18 and 19 for us. verse 18. He mentions that there are people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. And he says, that there, he, he says, I tell you this even weeping. When it says that there are people who are enemies of the cross, 
You can put that in modern terms here. That basically means people who view what God says as irrelevant, right? These people here, they didn't care about what God had to say. They didn't care about the message of the cross. It was irrelevant. Why? Why was it useless to them? Verse 19 explains it. He says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. The reason they don't care about what God has to say is because they are too busy minding the world. And then notice the part there in verse 19 when he says that their God is their belly. That may sound a little weird to us, and we think their God is their belly. Well, he's not literally talking about their actual stomach. He's simply saying there that the main thing that they desire to serve is their own fleshly appetites. That's what the word belly represents here. Their idol, their God that they go after and serve day and night constantly is their own worldly appetites. Now think about this. Let me illustrate it this way. And I think this will help you to get a better perspective of why God has given us the Old Testament. You know, a lot of times in the Old Testament, what the people of God would do is they would go and they would worship God at the temple. And they would bring these sacrifices to God and they would offer them up and they would burn them. But at the exact same time, they would be out there worshiping false gods. And most of the time, they were worshiping the false gods more than they would God. They would go to these altars of these false gods and would bring sacrifices and would offer them up. And they would do all other kinds of rituals that are not proper to talk about here in worship of these false gods. And they would offer up to God a sacrifice here, there, and yonder. They never completely gave up on God, but they really toned down how much sacrifices they offered to Him. All right, let's put it this way. you got two altars in your life, an altar in which you offer up sacrifices and service to God, and you got an altar in which you're offering up sacrifices to these idols, your appetites. How many sacrifices are you giving to them appetites? How many sacrifices are you giving to God? Weigh them. And then you will see who is really taking the place of preeminence here. Matthew 6, still says what it says, y'all, that God has to come first. And so, again, when you look at verses like Philippians 3 and the imagery that he's using of, you know, worshiping a false god, it makes sense when you look at it from the perspective of the Old Testament and the history that those people went through. They worship many different gods along with God. And sometimes we do the same thing today. So really and truly the point I'm making is that People don't care about the Bible because they think they can get what they need from the world. That's all I'm telling you. And you already know that. Christians are doing the same thing, and it should not be that way. We're going to have to do something to counter this. We're going to have to do something to show people that to get what you need, you need to be going to God and not the world. Because the world may have things that are fun and that please you, but in the end, they're not going to do anything but hurt you. You're going to get hurt if you go to the world. But if you go to God and His Word and you listen to that, that's going to do you good ultimately in the end. So i got a question for you now. The question is, how do you view God? What, what do you see God like? What, what is He to you? When, when you think about God, what's your perception of Him? Now this is an important question because you're view of God, your, your view of God, the way you see Him, it affects the way you see the Bible. Because if you see God as important, if you truly, in your heart's, your heart's eye, your mind's eye, you really see that God needs to take the place of preeminence in my life, and I want to give it to Him, if that's the view you have of God, then you're going to have that view of His Word. God is important to me. His Word's important to me. And the opposite of this is true as well. If I look at God as, oh, He's good and all, I'm great, but eh, I'm all right without Him. Then how do you think you're going to treat the Bible? I'm all right without it. You know, a lot of people are not really hardcore against the Bible. They're just really wanting to destroy it. They're just sort of indifferent towards it. And Christians are the same way. So the way you view God affects the way you see the Bible. Let's go to this scripture, Deuteronomy 31.12. Deuteronomy 31.12. 
how should I view God? So that way, I treat His Word the way I should. Deuteronomy 31 verse 12 gives you the answer. Deuteronomy 31, verse 12, somebody. <clears throat> Moses wants all the people gathered together, even the stranger. You know, remember, he's talking to the nation of Israel here. I want all of you, men, women, children, everybody, even your, your, the people who are in here, they're not really a part of our nation, they're just going along with everybody. I want y'all to come together and I want y'all to learn. What does he want them to learn? What does the verse say? What do they need to learn? The fear of the Lord. Why do they need to learn it? What's the end of the verse say? What's going to happen if they learn to fear God? Exactly. Moses says to the people of Israel, what y'all all going to need to be learning is to fear God. And when you do that, you will then observe to do all that He's commanded you to do. If you don't fear God, if you don't show any proper respect and honor towards Him, if you do not, that's basically what it means is you don't see Him as important. Will you observe to do the commandments of God? Will you see the Bible as important? No. So the first thing Moses did to the people is, look, I want y'all to take what God says seriously. So the first thing y'all need to learn to do is you better learn to fear God. That's the first thing I'm going to have to teach y'all. We're going to have to understand that God is worthy of our respect. So... The key to getting people to see the importance of the Bible, if we're going to do something to change all this, it's going to be to teach people to fear God. Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. This again is in the same context. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, and it's Moses speaking to Israel. He says, oh, or rather this is actually God speaking to Israel in this particular uh, verse. He says, Oh, that there was such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them. God is lamenting over His people. They have abandoned His word, many of them. And so God says, I just wish that these people would have a heart of which they would fear me. That's the first thing here. Fear me. And then what's going to happen? He says, fear me and keep all my commandments always. Wouldn't you like to always keep God's commandments? In other words, live consistently faithful to Him, not just sporadically? Say, yeah, I'd like to do that. Fear is the answer. And again, to fear God just simply means you honor Him. You recognize He is worthy to be served. I have great reverence for Him. And that's going to lead me to keep all of my commandments or all of his commandments. And when I keep all of his commandments, look what the verse says. That it might be well with them. You're going to have to show people that, look, the answer to making your life go well is not out there in the world. It comes from God. He's your creator. Don't you think he knows what it takes to make your life run the way it should? Well, yeah, of course he would. If anybody would know, it would be God. So Deuteronomy 5.29 really, I think, speaks to the problem here. And this was a verse that was written thousands of years ago. And yet its importance still shines through even today. We still need that verse today. So again, you can see the importance of the Bible even in our modern world. People have got to learn to respect God. Christians are the ones who have been given the obligation to counter this. We are the ones who have been given the obligation to show people why God is worthy of being served. In 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Who's going to persuade the world to take God serious? 
We are. That's our job. God's given that commandment to us. In Colossians 1.28, Paul says, talking about Jesus, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Again, Christians are the ones who are doing this, and teaching people and showing them why God is to be served. We have got to show people that God is worthy to be listened to. Look at this scripture. 1 Peter 2.9. I think this one really hits the nail on the head. 1 Peter 2.9. What is the church? What are Christians? What are we? Say, I don't know. Well, if you don't know, this verse will help you to know what the answer to that is. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Christians are, it gives you a good description, we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that means we're people who give God sacrifices spiritually. When we sing and we pray, we're offering sacrifices to Him. We're a holy nation, a peculiar people. What are we supposed to be doing? He just got through telling you what we are, but now he's going to tell you what we need to be doing. That ye should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what you better be doing. Show forth God's praises. What's that mean? The word praises is a key word here. That word basically means admirable characteristics is a good way I guess you could term it or if you want to put it this way praiseworthy qualities we show to people the praiseworthy attributes of God we show people his love we show people his kindness we show people the kind of God that he really is and when people see those attributes from God that's going to lead them to think why would I not serve him that's our job as Christians let me show you this last slide real real quick Folks, the world sees God through us. These attributes of God, how do you think they're going to see Him? They're going to see Him through you. They're going to see Him through me. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said that Christ liveth in me. Can the world see Christ living in you? If we're going to counter the trend of people falling away from the Bible, we need to make sure Christ lives within us and that we're demonstrating the qualities that He had. And that can do much to lead people to the Bible. So... Well, I'll end it off there. Uh, I appreciate you being here, and we will try to wrap up and conclude with all this next Sunday. So.